Hi, welcome to Drumwise Meets. Today I'm with a drummer who's a co-founder of Elbow. He also teaches privately and works at BIM Manchester and Lipper in Liverpool. This is Drumwise Meets, Rick Jupp. Hi Rick. Hi Tom, how are you doing? My first question for you today, what age did you get into drums and when you first started playing, what bands or artists inspired you? Right, so um, pretty early on, um, I remember sitting in a, a neighbour's uh, bedroom who was into sort of Maiden, DC, uh, Anthrax, that kind of thing. So, you know, like a sort of uh, Charlie Bonanti. Uh, but the thing that, that struck me was was um, Rudd, Bill Rudd. Um, because it was it's not easy. It was quite straightforward to understand, you know, backbeat, simple, down the line, creating space. So I remember being being sort of uh, struck by that or thunderstruck. Sorry, that's a really cheap guy. Sorry, I can edit this out. <laughs> uh, being struck by that, um, and then. Later on, um, there was a, a, a mate of mine, Matt Roberts, actually, who was very much into U2, and he was taking drum lessons. I had not thought about this, and he had a drum kit in his room, and we were listening to the Unforgettable Fire, uh, the U2 album, and that's when it sort of, sort of coalesced. Mm. And I sat down at the kit, and I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm self-taught, but I was just kind of, I think he hated me from that point on, but um, I just, I don't know, I just started playing. <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, it's all attributable to Larry Mullen Jr. Uh, I was talking to my son about this because he's, he's a far better drummer than I am. But we're talking about this and which album um, struck or, or got me thinking like, oh, I really like this. Uh, and I think it was Unforgettable with Fire. And then obviously with, Elbow, uh, or the, the initial incarnation of Elbow, and just hanging out, and we kind of bonded over U2, Rattle and Hum. And then, sort of later on, I came back, after leaving a okay, I came back to the sort of heavier stuff. Um, and then sort of Craig Reynolds, Strap and Pat, Double Kick, and you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a nice full circle. And when you first started, what was your first drum kit? Oh, mate, that's, a, that's, that's digging deep, that is. Uh, okay, so first, first drum kit, oh my God, we were rehearsing in, apart from using the ones at school, obviously, uh, my first kit was, um, I know that I am, sorry, Tossington High School, I stole a, a, a boss head and clamp. You know the ones that hold test tubes? Yeah. Yeah, the little clamp yeah. things? Yeah. Because I didn't have a cymbal stand. So it was an old, like, Olympic um, shell. There was a, a, a kick drum. I, I, I can't remember where I actually got it from. I think it was... You know, like somebody's dad or a mate's dad had a kit in the attic. Either, either one of the guys or, or, or a neighbour or something like that. And it was in shit state, you know, like worse than you could possibly imagine. But it was a kit, you know, there, there, was, a, there was a kick drum. I think there was one tom and a snare drum. And... We, we, I think, you know, it was probably Blue Peter. I mean, Blue, <laughs> Blue Peter, you know, like yeah. do it itself. And there was like, somebody had found some hi hats and there was a, there was a, a symbol there. Uh, but I remember my first proper kit was a Yamaha Power V, a white Yamaha Power V. 
Ah. Um, and that was that was amazing. I was like, I was playing Yamaha. I guess who played Yamaha? That's right, Larry Mullen Jr. Um, so yeah, went down to Johnny Roadhouse and bought the shell pack. Couldn't afford the stands or symbols, but I've got, I had the shell pack. Um, and that was my first proper kit. Ah, awesome. And my next part of that question then is, do you still have it, including the, the test tube clamp? No. <laughs> no, uh, because that would be 30... Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> so, no, I think, I think I got rid of, I got rid of that. I think I just, I think the shells had warped and it was, it was just in a bad state. Um, mm. And again, you know these things, uh, I, I saw a post from Tommy Igo, just in the, in the scroll hole um, on Instagram, uh, but it was so right, he, he's an absolute genius. And he just said, what's the point in having loads of drum kits mm. and loads of drum kits hanging around and not, not being played, you know? Um, and I completely agree. Plus the cost of storing them and, and making sure they're not warped and people put them in storage, then they, you know, it's cold and then it's hot. And, mm. and they're, they're, they're living beings as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, most of the kits that I've had, I've, I've kind of not got rid of, I've just got them to be played. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of feels much better. So, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's either it's, it's gone to the great gig in the sky um, or, you know, um, somebody's playing it. And Someone's playing with a ride cymbal held up with a test tube clamp. <laughs> There it is, there it is, you know, but I'll pass it on, you know. I, uh, I don't want to make your life easy, Rick, and the next question a few people have found uh, is quite a tough one. If you had to pick just one, who would be your all-time favourite drummer? That's such a shit question. <laughs> That's horrible, man. That's so bad. Yep. <laughs> right, okay. Um, Okay, so um, Matt Cameron. Okay. Because um, I think so. I mean, Phil Rudd is just—he's, you know, as I've said before with the ACDC thing, it, 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 it was just um, that simplicity, the, the 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 conscious decision to to sort of whether it was conscious or not, I don't know. Just just to sit right in the pocket. And you don't probably think he's a pocket player, but just, you know, a whole lot of Rosie. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To name but one. But I think yeah. for me personally, it would be um, Matt Cameron on, especially Super Unknown. That was another massive bonding, uh, bonding thing for all of us. But just his drumming it, it, on that album alone, is, is, I don't know, all killer, I think. Give us some other influences because, I mean, I started that by saying it's hard. I mean, it really is. I would genuinely struggle because mm. you'll agree with me, I'm sure. You have like your sort of childhood heroes and stuff. You know, you mentioned Phil Rudd earlier on. That, that even if they're not the best technical drummers or whatever, they are still your childhood heroes and you yeah. carry them with you forever. And then as you develop in age and on the instrument, you then draw on all these other influences. So it is a hard most question. Definitely, most definitely. And, and again, Larry Mullen Jr., he, 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 you know, he was the one who kind of, it was actually his drum tech. When I watched Rattle and Hum, there was a, there was a dude sort of crouched behind him and then, he, you know, just checking out, I thought, oh, that's cool. That's really cool, you know, because I didn't want to be in the limelight. Um, just this, this guy was like, right, obviously that's, that's a tech. And I thought, that's, that could be a cool thing to do. Mm. And then ended up being the drummer, so, you know, which was pretty good. <laughs> so who are your other, like, main so, influences? Main influences, uh, Jimmy Chamberlain. Um, again, another, another bonding for, for the band uh, was another bonding sort of uh, album, Siamese Dream. Obviously, with, with you know, didn't sort of directly relate to what we were doing in El in Elbow, um, but it was you know Sammy Stream was just like mind blowing on on, on many levels. Um, Larry Mullen Jr., uh, Lee Harris, uh, Talk Talk, 
which again was that was that was that sort of uh, subtle um, sort of um, feel based drumming. There was there was nothing superfluous about it. It was it was using uh, you know other other parts of the kit. It was it was dynamic awareness. It was just holding it down the line, bringing things up, bringing things down. You know what I mean? It just mm. it, it, it was that sort of <laughs> um, it, you know when you put your headphones. On, it was like putting a helmet on. It was just like you were, you were in there. You were ensconced mm. in the music uh, mm. with with talk talk. So. Um, other drummers, I mean Joey Waronka, uh, with the stuff he's done with Beck, um, Elich, I mean he's he's you know he, he's just a, a, a beautiful human being, um, and he knows his shit. Mm. You know, I, I, I draw a lot of uh, influence from him in terms of the psychology, the, the the sort of mental state of being on the kit, of, of voicing, of communicating um, your feel. Uh, also being able to listen and play at the same time, which is a skill in itself. Yeah. Um, uh, controlling multiple narratives. This is something I'm doing at the minute with all my students. Is is you know um, Benny Greb as well, in terms of talking while you're playing, but not in the same rhythm as you're playing. Yeah. So you can you can sort of drift um, drift between the vocal. Uh, line, bass line, move in and out, um, and not think of it as a rigid thing. Um, yeah, man, there's there, there's tons. Obviously, Tommy Igo, uh, singles, doubles, paradiddles. Um, that that's been an absolute lifesaver for me with different foot ostinatos. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, you know, as you say, you know, it's um, it's only Thursday. So, you know, there's, there's tons <laughs> more to find out. Exactly. Tomorrow it'll be a different list. This is the well, thing. There you, isn't go. It? there you go. There you go. So, um, I still don't want to make your life easy. And again, this one, <laughs> this I'm one, people, this. <laughs> people have found this one a tough one as well. Um, so, what's been the highlight of your career so far? Right. Um, the highlight of my career so far has been, um, I, I mean, the, there's, Seeing our first, seeing our first truck for the backline, when we kind of moved from the two thousand cap, um, one thousand five hundred cap, two thousand cap up to five thousand, when you have a production, yeah. so you have to then bring your rig in, you, you, you know, um, just a lot more gear. And there's a guy called uh, Johnny who um, who had a, who had a truck. He was he was sort of starting out, getting his own trucking company going. And yeah, it was just like shit. It's all that. It's all that for us. <laughs> and we all had this sort of like, oh, fucking hell, this this is. Weird. And it was the Apollo in uh, in, in Manchester. So I don't know, four eight or something. Uh, I think we did Brixton on that tour. And when you when you get into a venue of that size, you just you, you think something's something's happening yeah. here. Um, you do at every single level, but I think that is a very distinct jump. Yeah. You know. Um, so that was a that was a massive highlight. Um, I mean, shit, I've been lucky enough, and you know we've worked hard enough um, to have some experience. You know three nights at, at Sydney Opera House. I mean, shit, just remember yeah. that. Um, there's a photograph of uh, my boy uh, when he was about six or seven, I think it was. Um, maybe eight. And we were on just before Coldplay at Glastonbury and when Chris was still married to, to, to Gwynnie. Um, never met her, but, I, you know. Um, and there's a photograph of Dylan with Beyonce, Gwyneth and Jay-Z behind him. And Beyonce's got her hand on his shoulder. And the look on his face, I don't know whether it's here, it's fucking priceless. It's just like that. <laughs> so, you know, that was, a, that was an image. Um, and then promptly just before going on stage, you know the, um, the, the cable sort of 
tight that you know the, the sort of um, things that you step over. Yes, yeah. So you've got all the cables inside. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's for you going on the stage, um, and this was the year when everybody was singing "Hey Jude." It was on the oh. speakers, and just before we got on, they the crowd morphed it into into one day like this, um, and we had like hundred and thirty thousand people singing that tune, and it was like. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. Right, I'm gonna have another whiskey. Um, I've since stopped drinking, by the way. Um, but you know, we all had a, a look, and there was that kind of like, oh shit, this is this is big. Yeah. And then I, I promptly looked over, and Jay Z and Beyonce were stood there at the side of the stage, and they were going to watch us. So I immediately tripped over the, um, the 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 thing with the cables, and did that little run that you do to try and mask it. You tried to style it out, mate. I tried. So there you go. So and then and then probably had to do a had to do a gig in front of a lot of people. But <laughs> I, you know, I mean, shit. There's there's, there's a ton of stuff. But mm. yeah. so if I look up uh, videos of, of of you guys coming on stage at Glastonbury, I should be able to find you, you tripping might be able to, and. I don't and know. <laughs> I'm going to be scouring YouTube for that. <laughs> oh my god, it was styled, mate. Honestly, I knew what I was doing. And we're actually going to get on to uh, onto that right now. You've kind of answered my next question, but I, I want some more. So <laughs> have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you had to recover from? Um, so we know about your trip over the cable tidy. Um, have, there, have there been any sort of brain fails or gear fails or, or tripping hazard things? Massive, massive. Um, there was one where I misjudged getting onto the riser because it was quite a tall one. So you've got that thing and then I scraped my shin all the way down. Yeah, man. So you could you could pretty much see my head coming towards the kit and then you'd just see it drop. So that was cool. Um, my drum tech, Wayne, uh, wrote, don't fuck it up on um, the arena tours, uh, forgetting that there was an overhead cam then projecting onto the mag wall behind. 50 foot mag wall with don't fuck it up, written on my snare. Um, yeah, I've spilt drinks over the over the backing uh, track, the little little um, rolling thing that we used. Um, I've uh, the snare drum has dropped. That's a good one. Um, that was a crack. <laughs> that was a cracker. Uh, yeah. You're like playing like this, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh, what's the dude from Genesis? <laughs> that guy, the, the, the guy who played with, with, uh, with Phil Collins, I can't remember his name now. Chester um, Thompson. Chester Thompson. He had a super low, super low snap. Um, so, yeah, but obviously not as good as Mr. Thompson. Um, well, I don't know, your mug, your mug begs to differ. I think oh, this, yeah, this is mug. the time Sorry, to bring I, out I the mug. Know. Yeah. Just, you know, that was from my son. Bless him. <laughs> Dylan, <laughs> thank you, Dylan. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's been tons of stuff, man. Um, you know, obviously, uh, bass, you know, the, the kick head's going through without you knowing, and then it's like, douche. Um, yeah, that was mm. just tough, man. That was just tough. <laughs> Excellent. So, from one educator here to another, because obviously you teach as well, um, this question, I kind of put my, my drum teacher hat on just to mm -hmm. show people um, that everybody learns things differently and they have a different approach to, to learning. So for you, obviously, with the elbow stuff, I, I imagine this doesn't apply in the same way because you were probably part, quite a big part of the songwriting process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but just in general, um, when you first get a gig with a new artist or you're having to learn new material, mm -hmm. how do you learn the material? Do you just listen? Do you listen and transcribe? Or has it ever happened where someone said, here you go, Rick, here's a folder of all of the drum notation for you to read through. Can't read. I've never read. Um, what I do do, um, I get, uh, especially at, at, at both Lipper and BIM, uh, where it's, it, it's a lot more regimented, there's a scheme of work, but, you know. I get uh, anybody who can read to teach the rest of the class, me included. That for me, I mean, you know, I'm learning. You, you never, never should stop learning or be um, 
you know, self-effacing and just go, look, I don't know, so help me. Mm. You know, um, all I've done is 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 amassed a lot of practical experience um, in terms of how to write, how to remember, how to recall. Um, so I think for for me, the sessions that I've done um, when I was when I was with the band and um, you know since leaving, I just I just listen. Um, I listen over and over and over. If anything, I've learnt more about the benefits of cheat sheets, of just verbatim writing down. So even if it makes absolutely no sense, what you're actually you're sorry, what you what you're trying to do is actualize what you're listening to on a page. Okay, so you know, and I, I see, you know speaking to uh, I think it was uh, Craig Lundell when he got the Stephen Wilson tour, I, 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 I kind of caught him when he was doing the, the drum show up in Manchester mm. a few years back. And, you know, obviously I'd seen him sort of prepping online and Instagram and, and, and socials and stuff and uh, getting it all together. Fucking hell. I mean, that, that must have been intense. And he said he wrote everything down. He was cheat sheeting, he was listening, he was doing everything just for his own confidence so I mean for me personally because I don't read um, obviously notation wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't work but you know the two bars of this four bars of that squiggly bit there's the the fast bit the half tight you know what I mean mm -hmm. so it's it's that sort of shorthand uh, basic thing but I think for, for, for me I listen to uh, tracks you know, out of context. So obviously in the car, when you're doing your, your when you're cooking, when you you know you're doing your ironing, these things don't really apply to students. Um, as I've said to my son on many many occasions, but when you're doing it out of context, you're using a different part of the brain. Um, and I kind of I kind of did this with my um, PG Sir um, for that accreditation. I'm never going to do anything like that again, by the way. It was so fucking hard. <laughs> anyway, um, but I think that, that I'd, I'd like to do research in that area in, in how we learn. And I think it's, it's our responsibility as, as educators and, and facilitators to, 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 to get, understand that process for ourselves, but more importantly for, for, for the students. Because, yeah, everybody's different, man. You know, yeah. um, and this is why the education system needs a needs a um, a, a massive shake up because otherwise it's just you know it's a sausage factory and you know um, we've had it with with um, with our son Dylan who's who's got uh, Asperger's um, and it's you know <laughs> yeah. um, he went to uh, with the with the success of the band he was able we sort of brought him out of um, um, state primary school and he went into a private school for a bit and then it went up to senior school <sighs> nothing no Senko no thought he was just a naughty boy and he would have been ignored yeah. so he went to the, the local comp and they were absolutely brilliant they had frameworks in place they knew exactly what to do and he flourished yeah. you know um, and understanding it from his point of view as we should do from from every sheet, and yeah. I know you, I know you're the same because you know the feedback that I get from from people talking about the, the way you do it is 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 really enlightening and really influential. So you know, massive props to you as well, man. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I, it's funny, yeah. You say that I totally believe in that. That everyone is different. So people inquire about lessons or or something. Sometimes they're like, oh, so you know, how do you do it? And I'm like, well. I can't tell you that until I meet the student and see how they learn. And, you know, sometimes we use this screen to put sheet music on. Sometimes we put it there. We put, we do vi a video on there. Sometimes we put an overhead shot of me playing on that kit on there. You know, it all depends on the student. And one thing I really don't like is when someone goes in for a lesson initially, first drum lesson, right, here's a load of drum music, off you go. And like, I'm totally against that um, yeah. because it just focus on the instrument first rather than 
theory. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think that reading drum music is a great skill to be able to have. I'm not saying hey, absolutely, it's, absolutely. it's not the be all and end all. Of course it's not, but it's a good mm -hmm. skill because it helps you, as you said, about recalling stuff, seeing mm -hmm. it and, and getting it back. But um, yeah, everyone's different. And um, yeah, I'm totally with you on that one. That's, an, that's another three hour conversation that we could have. <laughs> It really is. It really is. And I've, uh, I, have to, I have to send you a copy. I've written a, a book called Find Your Beat, which is for complete beginners. Um, and it does get on to uh, reading drum music at the end, but the whole first bit is all like colourful words and diagrams and, yeah, and stuff like that. Because Absolutely. I just thought, well, no one's written a book like that as far as I could tell. Like mm. it's all drum music based and it needs to be like something that adults can do and kids can do as well. It doesn't matter if they're six or 60, you know, it's Absolutely. Good. Yeah. So Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more, man, because, you know, you know how amazing it feels to sell a kit. You know mm. what I mean? With, mm. You don't even have to play. And, you know, I know this sounds really like a cheap cliche, but it, I feel complete. And... Mm. That sounds really naff, but I don't care because I do. And same with my son. And thankfully, same with, with you know, all of my students. And they keep coming back, which is, yeah. always, a, which is always a good sign. Um, and I think it, it, it's just allowing, allowing them to just make noise and go, yeah, can, can you make more noise? Yeah. Right, and just we're going to make a little less noise. Right, and we're going to do one, two, three, four, kick on the one or three, you know, fill rudd. Yeah. There you go. Um, and the look on the face, that's mm. that's where it is. That's and it's it. like, look, you, you you're a drummer now. Yeah, that's it. It's it's all it's all about that, totally. Now, on to a couple of curveball questions, kind of going away from drums a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So the first one of those is what are your hobbies away from drums? Surfing. Right. Surfing. Cool. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that, so, that, that's kind of it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, as as the usual joke about drummers is, um, pretty pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, you know, I, I, I just need to get better at it, and I think it's it, it's it's a beautiful thing. I, I love I love watching it. I love thinking about it. Um, and just that thing of being out in the sea, sat on your board, you know, once you make it out back, and then, yeah, it's amazing. It, it, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, um, it's, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I hate golf. Um, I used to work in a really horrible golf club back in the day. Um, so it's kind of put me off for life, but I, pre I presume it's that sort of, you know, you never, you're always constantly striving always constantly striving to get it right or, or, or to learn you know micro adjustments there's so many sort of um, unknowns with it and obviously you know being in the ocean yeah. it's just being near the ocean it's just a, it's just a, a beautiful thing um, and yeah so yeah that that that's pretty much it I think um, kind of busy like yourself you know uh, and being self-employed mm. you know you sort of back to back September to to July and then you've got you know, July and then August um, but you're teaching and doing everything else and mm. uh, you know um, dad husband you know that yep. that takes time man um, yeah. and you know I think just trying to be a better person that, that takes a bit of <laughs> A bit of energy and effort. So, yeah. No, that that's cool. And that that question, people that have watched several of these are going to get so sick of me saying this. But that question <laughs> has has come from the fact that that drums start out as a hobby for all of us, um, and we're just lucky, fortunate, you know, work hard mm. enough, all of those things, that it becomes our job. But I still think, you know, I, I still think of it as a hobby, even though it pays the bills and it has done for ages. It's still something I enjoy doing. So if someone said to me, "What are your hobbies?" Drums will be the first thing on my list. Well, I think it, I think you're right. I think it, it, it's it, it's from you know the previous generation. Um, that sounded negative, and I didn't mean it in that way. Um, 
whereas my mum and dad would be they would be work and they would be hobby mm. so as we've mm. we've sort of moved forward it, 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 you know um, I remember the time when you know I kind of completely asked my A-levels and it was like I was going to go to uni and, and do this and we had that sort of crossroads to, to face the band was all right you know it was just hanging out um, and and you know seeing what was what was going to happen yeah. and then I think it was you know whether I didn't even try really to pass my levels you know let's be honest but um, completely fucked them up and so it was the band right mm -hmm. let's do that um, and mum and dad were obviously like oh, shit man what are you doing what's what are you doing right okay and then they came to a gig and they saw me drunk and they were like ah right that's what you're doing okay cool and it was it, it was sort of yeah that's yeah. sort of okay well well this a vocation it, it, it's yeah. it's something that you love but you can make money off obviously again worked hard enough um we're lucky enough right place right time and it and it's it's come to this so and yeah, you're right. I think it's um, it, it, it's something that I I'm still of that ilk where I have to I have to go to work. <laughs> to, do you know what I mean? Um, as as because we moved away from where I had the drum shed, and now I'm thinking, why the fuck didn't I, why didn't I do more? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But it was there, and since moving here and waiting for a dr drum shed to be built, I have to go to a place in Stockport which is like 15 minutes away and I do more I've done more since I've moved here because I'm going somewhere yeah yeah that makes sense I, I totally find that because this isn't attached th this is like round the corner from my house right. and I find that yeah like it's it's because it's here it's so easy to not come in here <laughs> um, well Eddie Eddie Thrower was saying the same um, yeah. and he's I think he's since moved moved premises but he was saying it's great because I can I can just disengage a little bit, and mm. obviously he's got he's got his little one uh, mm. as well now. But um, disengage a little bit and come to work. Mm. Yeah, and and that's where the two sort of meet. And I've got you know I'm paying for it, and there's the, the, there's time, and I've got to set up, and I've got to pack down, you know. Mm. Uh, whereas I did I did I think I did just take it for granted mm. when it was just it was there, and it was yeah, like yeah. Oh, do, you, do you know what I'll, I'll I'll do the washing or there's a bit of lining or there's, you know what I mean? Or, or stuff to do. Yeah, yeah, so. I know exactly what you mean. So my next curveball question for you, the most anticipated question of the whole Drumwise Meats series. Mm -hmm. Here we go. What's your favorite biscuit? Custard cream. Okay, really easy, quick answer. That's it. It's usually two with a cup of coffee. And if I have a, if I have a coffee, um, I can easily get through. Uh, you know they, they do a double pack, don't they? Mm. Like I can eat all of them. <laughs> when you say two, you mean like you literally pick up two custard creams, two, and have a them dip, together. Dip, or I'm actually quite. I do quite like one crunch and then take a sip. And you get that kind of biscuit mush in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, we found out a bit ago uh, gluten intolerant. Yeah. So that that's killing me a bit. Uh, uh, not having the bit, and they don't taste the same. I'm guessing. Um, yeah, I'm guessing the biscuits aren't quite the same. Not quite the same. It's a little bit. You know, it's a little bit more sort of cardboard. It it's fine. Mm. It's a first world problem. I can <laughs> I can deal with it. But there are the odd times when, you know, I'm at work and uh, I do feel the need for a biscuit and mm. just, I have them. Um, and I just sort of suffer the consequences. <laughs> um, but there's nothing that beats. What about you? What's your favourite biscuit? Oh, you can't ask me that. So many people have turned this round on me recently and I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think... Um, Probably a a, cho a milk chocolate hobnob is is Decent. really good. Do you dunk? Um, and with a, with a dunk, definitely. It's, it's got to be a dunk. It's got to be a dunk. Well, and as, as uh, Peter Kay said, there's 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 solidity and consistency with hobnobs as opposed to your rich tea, which just break off when you're breathing them. Exactly. Um, 
So yeah, that's a good choice, man. You've got to be careful with there's certain biscuits that are danger dunks, you know. Danger dunks. Um, you, you know, and also about how long you leave it in for. Bring it out. It takes it takes years. <laughs> it takes years of dedication. It and does. Focus, you know, sort of spending ten years in the Himalayas, <laughs> focusing at a at a sort of biscuit monastery. <laughs> and something I've been asking people as well, you know, people in bands. Um, has there ever been anything really interesting on Elbow's rider over the years that you can? <laughs> we uh, we did, um, and this is this is so not funny, but uh, it, it turned into something. Um, uh, Haynes Manual. Have you ever heard oh, of yeah. Haynes Manuals? Yeah, we asked for them, and we kept getting them, and we kept getting them for years. So you'd have, you know, your Morris Minor, or you'd have whatever whatever they did and we, we built up quite a collection actually um and you'd get them at you know at a gig in fucking germany or or whatever i don't know anyway i think we, we had them in australia uh, as well that, that was quite cool wow um, and it was just coming over haynes manual which does is, anyone just, does anyone still have the the collection there must be somewhere there must be some they're probably with phil at the office um our manager uh, well ex-manager for me but um yeah probably there and there's probably hundreds of them <laughs> oh that's that, that was it i mean i mean obviously you know you get to a point where you know you get your greg's pasties and a and a and a kick up the arse and when you're starting out and then um you you, you can push it quite far actually when, when you get you know uh, up to sort of arena level yeah when you're doing three nights at the sydney opera house yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it, I think we missed we missed a trick there. <laughs> that could have been that could have been quite good. Yeah, you could have been um, like, I want sand on the dressing room floor, and I want some fake palm yeah, tree. Yeah, yeah. I want. Uh, 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 yeah, I want everything in yellow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and nobody can look at me in the <laughs> yeah. eye. That was a good one. I've heard. Some, we've. Well, I mean, we've heard some stories about other people. <laughs> <laughs> so on to my last question and that is if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self so when you first started out playing mm -hmm. or when you first started uh, taking drums more seriously what would that advice be um enjoy it more <laughs> that's it um i was always a bit of a worrier um so it was the sort of what if scenario um, uh, instead of I, I kind of should have been like, well, what is, what's happening? You know what I mean? Um, I think and also dr uh, drink less and everything else that is is attributed to that um, because there was a lot of times that you know you were in Singapore or you were in. Perth, or you were in LA, or you were in like in Vancouver, and you know, or, uh, Auckland was was beautiful, and that was one of the last tours that I did. Was a uh, uh, Aussie New Zealand tour, um, and I was um, I'm not saying it's sober, uh, but I, I did I didn't drink. I wasn't drinking then. It was great. I was up, you know, and as everybody who who has been through that says and it's like oh my god there's, there's a world out there yeah. instead of being cooped up and hung over um and i think in, in in terms of yeah just just relax and in, enjoy it more um even if it's not okay it's okay there's nothing that's insurmountable <laughs> you know that kind of vibe so rick thank you so much for spending your time with us here at drumwise today it's been a pleasure talking to you Absolute pleasure for me too, Tom. Uh, really good to, uh, to 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 speak to you, and uh, and yeah, thank you for everything that that, that you're doing as well.